Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, this is a workshop about fermentation, but uh, really we're about to travel across space and time. And today we're going to build our very own space-time travel portals, and they're going to be fueled by fermentation. This is a collaborative project between all of us here, animals, humans, plants, minerals, bacteria. You can say it's an interspecies collaboration. The human body contains 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. So take the time to say hello to all of them. <laughs> they are friends. Um, fermentation is a process that works symbiotically with our environments. It's grounded on a continuous cycle of exchange. So external factors like temperature, humidity, even other fauna and flora can influence it. And a process, uh, this is a process that is rooted in understanding of life as an interconnected infinite system beyond concept. A process which is as site specific as it is universal. And it tells us loudly, we are one. So today we're gonna take the tools that have been given to us by nature and we're gonna open up this portal. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining the workshop. Before we start, I just wanna do a little bit of um, housekeeping <laughs> and to tell you all that uh, if possible, um, keep your microphones muted throughout the session just so we avoid uh, feedback. If you want to ask any questions, uh, please do throughout. There's a, a way to do that, which is um, uh, the raise your hand option. So if you go down to the bottom bar of Zoom, uh, there's a little button that says participants and there should be an option there for you to raise your hand. I'll keep an eye, on, uh, an eye out for um, anyone who uh, has raised their hand and I'll unmute you so you can ask your question. But if for any reason I can't, um, I'm not picking up on it, please just uh, write it right on the chat and just say, hey, I have a question or write your question down. Um, so I can, I can see it and there's a question already. Uh, there is. I think. Let's have a look. Um, oh, I can't see it. Was there? Oh yeah. There's just a notice from, from <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I was confused. Um, anyway, yes, the instructions are, are in the chat um, for how to, how to ask me a question. Um, so I'll start by taking you through through a little bit of my work and why fermentation is important for me and why it's part of my creative practice, why it is creative practice for me. Um, and then we will get started with um, actually the hands-on fermenting. Um, so I will... share my screen with you. And There we go. So um, fermentation, um, I should start by saying that um, fermentation has been a part of my practice for, for a few years now. My name is Ines, <laughs> maybe I should start there. And I'm an artist, I work with food and people and spaces um, as a way to uh, initiate conversation and discussions. I'm interested in themes of collaboration, of togetherness, of narrative, and I work in between performance and installation. Um, through my work, I'm really interested in how we can create closer links between humans and nature. Um, so um, in doing that, for example, last year, I was part of a project uh, in the Azores um, for a arts, an arts festival called Walk and Talk. I, upon arriving in, in the Azores, which is an archipelago of islands uh, in the Atlantic, um, I brought my sourdough starter with me from, from London all the way there. And I took it on this sort of performative walk where um, I had it with me strapped to my waist. Um, and I took it on a walk to introduce it to the land, to the local bacteria, as a way of saying, of, of talking about fermentation as this site-specific practice that works with the environment and absorbs things that live around it. Um, following that, I worked collaboratively with a local chef um, to learn about this traditional uh, cooking process of the Azores, which uh, is a group of volcanic islands. Um, and they have this process of cooking where they uh, bury pots of food underground, the food gets cooked with geothermal heat. Um, and so towards the end of my week there, I produced this meal uh, where all the food presented was uh, in a way cooked by nature. So, um, or transformed by nature, should I say, without any um, 
man-made energy intervention. So it was filled with fermented things, like, as you can see here, um, and a um, bread cooked underground, just using the volcanic heat, um, using the starter that I'd walked around the island. <laughs> Following that, I took the same sourdough starter, which had already changed and evolved, um, to Italy, uh, to a residency uh, in, in Tuscany, where I spent six weeks with nine other artists. And um, I pledged to bake a loaf of bread every day and share it with them. And I, I, did, I did do that, and I saved a slice of each of those breads, which I dried and hung up in my studio. Uh, by the end, I had a collection of slices from all the breads that I, I had um, produced, and I, took a little piece of each of those slices and placed them into a, on the inside of, a, of the dough or final, final loaf that we shared at the end of, of the residency. Um, you can see the process here and here we are sharing it at the end. And this was a way of, of trying to, to present fermentation as this, as I said before, this portal through space and time, this way of stretching physical and, and temporal dimensions um, and kind of an idea of a metaphor as well, which I, I work a lot with in my, in my practice and how um, big things can fit into small things and, and how really that is the definition of a metaphor. Uh, speaking of big things fitting into small things, I produced this little ceramic vessel uh, towards the end of my residency, which now contains uh, part of my, of my sourdough starter, which is, it's been sealed with beeswax and it's sitting in Italy, um, waiting for maybe one day um, someone or me to return and revive it and bake another loaf of bread with a piece that I saved from the final loaf. <laughs> um, so from here, um, I'd like to take you through the sort of really basic um, notions of fermentation and what it is and why it's good for us and, and what we need to know before we get started. Um, please, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I will keep an eye out for any raised hands. Um, so fermentation, what is it? <laughs> It's uh, the transformation of food by microorganisms, basically. If we're talking about fermentation in, in the food context, um, that's what happens when food is fermented. And we probably eat fermented foods almost every day. Yogurts, uh, beer, wine, cheese, um, they're all um, soy sauce, they're all fermented foods. Um, and why, is fermented, uh, why, is, why are fermented foods good for us? Um, it's because fermentation works um, in, in the transformation of this food, the microorganisms, microorganisms that are responsible for it are sort of pre-digesting certain elements, um, certain nutrients in, in the food um, before we even eat them. So when they're presented to us in our bodies, they, they arrive in this much simpler form, uh, which is much, much more easy for, much easier for us to absorb, for our bodies to absorb. And also fermentation is kind of whatever's fermenting in a jar is gathering all of these beneficial microbes, which once we uh, eat, they travel to our guts and they populate our guts and help us have better digestion, better sleep, sleep cycles, more energy. Um, and our gut has been said to be our second brain. So they're pretty important. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just differentiate quickly with, uh, the difference between pickles and ferments. Um, mostly because of, I guess, language in, in, in English, pickles tend to be sort of a bit of everything, a bit of any, any kind of preserved vegetables or fruits. But here I'd like to make a difference, uh, whereas pickles are normally done with vinegar and with a hot bath of vinegar, which um, aims at destroying most microbiological life through the acidity of the vinegar and through the heat. Um, fermenting, fermenting actually works with microorganisms and um, sort of welcomes them to an extent <laughs> in um, preserving and, and kind of extending the life of our food. So what we're gonna to do today is fermenting and not pickling. And something that you will encounter if you read about fermentation um, or if you go and do some research, uh, something that keeps coming up is the importance of taste and smell, which I find is a really beautiful idea. And it's sort of this notion that um, fermentation you know, regardless of us following recipes or um, trying to be really precise with our methods, it's kind of a wild process because it, it's, it depends on all of these external factors that um, we can't control. So um, we really need to trust our gut and trust our taste of, uh, taste of smell and of taste in order to understand um, where the fermentation process is, if things are going well, if they're not. So trust yourself. 
<laughs> when fermenting. Um, but always err on the side of caution. If anything looks really moldy and kind of fuzzy, um, don't eat it. <laughs> but um, but generally, t trust your senses. They've helped us immensely in, in, in our evolutionary history as humans and have allowed us to distinguish a really ripe piece of fruit, something that would give us energy from a rotting piece of uh, flesh that will kill us probably. Um, and I find that it's a really beautiful way of connecting back to our origins. Um, and speaking of uh, trusting our senses, um, fermentation is sort of, it's a, it's a thin line between, there's a thin line between rotting and fermenting. Um, there's a really amazing metaphor in uh, the Noma book of fermentation, which is um, which has come out of a restaurant in Copenhagen called Noma, where they say that rot is a nightclub where everyone gets in. And you've got to be the bouncer of that nightclub. So you've got to know your um, basic cleanliness measures in order to decide what bacteria is going to come in and give, give you a great party and, what, and the ones that are just going to tear the house down. So um, keep an eye out for sanitizing and salt. <laughs> and these are the two basic things that you should know about before we start fermenting, really. Uh, two important things. So sterilizing. Um, it just means starting with clean equipment and clean hands. Uh, you don't have to go crazy and, and kind of um, in, in the context that we are now. I think um, these things have been really on our minds, but um, it just means but we're going to do that to our jars today. I'm going to show you how. Um, and it just means that you start with a clean slate uh, for good bacteria and good microbes to grow in your, in your ferments and not to ruin them. And salt percentages are really important as well. This might sound really intimidating, but salt is really helpful in kind of, to a degree, um, welcoming uh, good bacteria and, and kind of keeping off bad bacteria and, and molds and things like that. So we're gonna work with a standard measure of 2% of salt, and that's 2% of the weight of your vegetables. And that's why I've asked you to bring a kilo of vegetables and 20 grams of salt. So that's roughly the, me the measure you should go with. Um, I wouldn't go much lower than that, and I wouldn't go much higher than 4%, for example, uh, because then you start getting into a curing process and, and you're not fermenting anymore. Um, and, and fine salt or coarse sea salt works as long as they're not table salt, uh, which normally has chemicals added to it, and that might interfere with, um, with the fermentation process. Um, okay, so uh, those were the little bits that I wanted to go through with you before we get started. Um, and um, I've got my veggies, my jar, <laughs> and my spices ready. And um, if we could all do a little show of veggies, and you, if you want to enter the gallery view so we can share. I've got some cabbage and some carrots. There we go. Carrots, cauliflower. Oh, beautiful purple carrots. Look at that. Nice. This is great. Lots of carrots. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, that's great. Um, again, I really um, <laughs> look, there's someone with an artichoke at them in their background. Um, <laughs> I really um, encourage everyone to put on their video, but of course, that's really up to you. Uh, it was, it's more of a sharing thing. Um, but um, but if, you, if you'd rather keep it off, uh, do, do keep it off. Uh, so we can get started. Um, you've, if you've got your jars, I've got this one which is a little bit bigger than one liter. One liter should be fine. Or if you don't have a jar as big as this, um, just get, you know, you can, you can separate your mix across several jars. Uh, that's totally fine. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to tilt my camera a bit. I'm going to, uh, I've got my freshly boiled water here. I'm just going to pour some boiling water inside. So this is the, sanit the sterilizing process. Um, and it's really simple. We're not doing any complicated sterilizing, none, none of that sort of restaurant level sterilizing. And what I'm doing really carefully is sort of switching the, the boiling water around to make sure I get to all sides. Don't burn yourselves, please. <laughs> and this is just gonna help us, as I said before, have sort of a clean slate for our good, good microbes to grow <laughs> and to um, populate our food. Um, so let's leave that there, doing its thing. Um, again, if anyone has any questions throughout, please just raise your hand or put it in the chat and I'm more than happy to answer. Um, and I'm gonna get on with my veggies. 
So I've got some cabbages here, they're different kinds, and a bit of carrot. Um, and what we're gonna do now is chop them um, relatively finely. You don't have to be super precise. Um, the, the, the finer your vegetables are, the quicker they'll ferment. Um, so I usually go, I've, I've done some chopping before, and I go with sort of this kind of uh, thickness. Uh, so there's a little bit of body, but um, it's not too chunky. But see what you can manage with your knife. Um, I'm just going to do this half as well. This is a savoy cabbage, which I really love. But again, um, as long as you follow the 2% of salt rule, um, any vegetables will ferment well, apart from soft, thing, soft things like herbs or spinach. Uh, tend to not work so well um, in general. Save your odds and ends for stock later, don't throw them away. I keep a bag in the freezer um, and then when I'm ready I just throw it on the pot and make some stock. So I'm going to throw that in and I'm going to do the same with the rest of my cabbage. And um, you can carry on doing this. If, if, we, if I reach to the end of my chopping and you've not finished, don't worry. Um, you can you can slowly follow along the process. I'm going to send everyone the we're going to send everyone the recipe at the end. Also, if you want to do it again, or if you want to, to carry on later. Um, and while I do this, um, I just wanted to sort of maybe go back to this idea of, of fermentation as a process that allows us to stretch and play with dimensions of time and space. Um, fermentation works really closely with the environment and it's something that reminds us that we're, we're not above nature and we're not um, controlling it and we can't and we shouldn't. It's, what we're doing right now is just setting the stage for fermentation to happen. Um, we're not really making it happen. <laughs> fermentation has been around forever and um, it's even been linked to the origin of human life on the planet. Um, so really, we could say that, we can't say that we've created fermentation, it's, it's better to say that fermentation created us, which I think is quite a beautiful idea to follow on. Um, and, and this process is really um, affected by things like temperature and humidity in the air, um, you'll notice if you've got other friends doing fermentation as well and maybe you do the same recipe around the same time, your ferments are going to turn out slightly different because they'll be influenced by how hot your kitchen is or how humid it is or the bacteria that live in your hands, uh, on your hands. So it's really, a, in a way, it's a very site-specific process and, and something that in a, in, in a way, it's sort of a, an archive that exists in this jar, um, an, an archive of micro information about a place and its people, um, which I think is a, is a fascinating notion if you're talking about um, a closer relationship to our environment, because in the end, we end up, so what a way to become closer to it. <laughs> um, I'm, I've got, nice little ribbons of cabbage um, and I'm gonna leave them in my bowl and I'll, uh, I'll get on with this carrot and a, a way that I found um, as an easy way to chop a carrot sort of finely in, in, in not as fine as the cabbage but is to sort of slice it lengthwise like this so I have two slices and then um, I go sort of long ways with my relatively sharp knife, it's not super sharp. And I cut strips off of it. You can also do this, uh, you can grate it, you can use a vegetable peeler, but today, because I wanted to make a point that fermentation can be done without much equipment, um, we can just use our knives. And I'm just literally just cutting ribbons off of it. And they're sort of coming out like this. And um, because carrot is a really hard vegetable, cutting it this finely just means that it, it will ferment at the same time, at the same speed as um, the cabbage. So I'm going to throw that in. I leave the skin on in my carrots. Um, I just gave it a light wash. The skin actually contains lots of nutrients and actually lots of great um, yeasts and bacteria that will 
kickstart your fermentation process. So I rarely peel my carrots unless they're really grubby or I can't really trust where they came from. <laughs> um, so there we go, cutting into thin strips. I see everyone very focused, heads down, chopping away. <laughs> very nice to see you all. Uh, question, can you use sweet potato? Yes, you can use sweet potato. Um, you can use normal potatoes even. Um, and again, use the same, um, the same measure, 2% to 3% of salt. Um, don't go above 4%. And you should be good to go with sweet potato. Um, I've, uh, I've seen it done where uh, people have chopped up potatoes uh, as if they were going to do some, um, they were going to do you know, chips, deep fry them. Uh, but they ferment for a few days beforehand and then they, they get deep fried. So you get this new depth of flavor. So if you wanna try that, highly encourage it. Okay, I've got my bowl of veggies. Um, right, what if we don't have the means to measure 20 grams of salt and we have to guess? Can you show what that amount looks like? For sure. Um, so, Fermenting, I recommend having scales, but if you don't, um, that's not a big deal. Uh, 20 grams of salt sort of looks like this. I'll put it in my hand. It's kind of like two, two tablespoons, more or less. Um, two, two scant tablespoons, um, that would be. And, um, and you, should be, you should be all right with that measure if you, if you know that you've got roughly a kilo of vegetables. Um, so, I've got my veggies. Now that I've poured the salt into my hand, I'm going to pour the salt in um, just on top. This is fine salt, um, uh, sea salt, not table salt. Um, coarse sea salt is fine too. Um, and really what the salt does is um, we're going to work it through the vegetables. And what it does is it's going to draw out the moisture and it's going to make the vegetables softer um, and kind of submerge them in their own liquid. So we're gonna do a little massaging in a bit. Um, I just wanna make sure everyone's all right with our chopping. Um, I can, there we go. Uh, so I've, I've added my salt in, if you wanna go ahead and do that. Uh, and I've got some spices. So the spices are really up to you. There's no definite measure. I've sort of suggested a tablespoon of spices, but really um, you, can, you can do whatever amount um, you feel like doing. I see some ginger, beautiful. <laughs> um, so I've got some garlic, which I've peeled previously. And I've also got some fresh turmeric, which I've been in love with recently. They look like little worms. <laughs> and they give just a beautiful flavor and amazing color uh, too. So, these are my spices, but you can use uh, dried spices, uh, fresh garlic, fresh ginger, fresh turmeric, dried garlic, dried turmeric, uh, coriander seeds, cumin seeds, um, anything that you like. Um, should the whole spices be ground a bit? Um, if you've got stuff like coriander seeds or, for example, peppercorns, um, if you give them a good bashing around, that will help release more flavor and the, the, will help release the flavor more easily. Um, so I do that usually just by kind of pressing down with the side of my knife onto the spices or using the bottom of a, of a heavy pan to just crush them lightly. You don't, you don't need a food processor or, or a spice grinder to, to do that. So, um, so yeah, if you want to, if you want to kind of bash your, bash your spices around a little bit, that's, that's great. I'm going to go ahead and chop these up. Um, I love garlic in, in whatever I'm doing in my ferments. So I think it gives a lovely flavor. And also somehow garlic is, makes your ferments very active. <laughs> um, and it's always really satisfying to see when they're bubbling away really nicely. Um, I think it has, to do, it has something to do with the allicin um, in the garlic. So I'm chopping it up um, kind of finely, not super fine. Um, and I'm going to throw that in. Mm -hmm. And I've got lovely garlicky hands now. There we 
go. Um, and I'm going to do the same with the other one. Um, but, um, the amount of spices that you put in is really up to your own personal taste. Um, if you like milder flavors, I would keep it simple. But if you like um, sort of stronger, spicier flavors, uh, go crazy. <laughs> Anything, anything you fancy, anything you like, uh, can go in really. There's no hard or fast rule. Um, so that's my garlic thrown in, and I'm gonna do my turmeric. I'm not gonna peel it. Again, I like keeping the peels in. Um, I know this is nice organic turmeric, so um, I'm gonna put that in, and I'm gonna get yellow fingers, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm just slicing it, sort of little pieces. I'm going to show you what they look like. So I'm slicing it like this. It's falling on my laptop. Uh, there we go. Throwing that in. Um, so what we're making here is really a very basic sauerkraut. Um, and I think sauerkraut is a very flexible term, which can be applied to any sort of simply fermented vegetables. It's traditionally done with cabbage, but uh, really you can have a parsnip sauerkraut, you can have sweet potato sauerkraut. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they'll follow generally the same rule, 2% salt. Um, there we go. So I've got my bowl of chopped up veggies, chopped up garlic, um, and turmeric and my salt. And the next step is we're going to scrunch up these vegetables with our hands. Um, if you want, you can use gloves for this. I like to use my bare hands. There's lots of good bacteria and yeast living in our skin. I want to impart a little bit of me into this. Um, so I encourage you to do that as well. And um, we just are going to work the salt into the vegetables by really um, quite vigorously scrunching everything up and you're going to do this for a few minutes depending on your vegetables uh, it might take longer or it might be quicker uh, that will depend on how old your vegetables are and how much water there is in them um, and what kind yeah what kind of vegetables you have um, so they should produce some liquid if they don't, um, I'll, I'll let you know a little trick for that um, once we finish our scrunching up. Um, but you'll start to see that they're gonna start to feel wetter. You can even hear it in the difference, in the difference in sound. Um, mine are already looking a little bit wet. They're not there yet. So I'm gonna keep going. And really don't, no need to be delicate with this. <laughs> Uh, you can really go for it and uh, don't worry about um, about it being too too violent. <laughs> um, you really want to get in there and make sure that the salt is really getting rubbed in um, into your cabbage and your carrots or whatever you're using really. Um, I'm just going to do a little scroll through to see if anyone has questions. Um, there we go. Great. Um, so my veggies are getting there. And if you use spices, maybe now you'll start to feel the aroma of the spices kind of permeating the air because you're working them through the vegetables. Um, so you know that they're doing their thing and you're going to get a really lovely fragrant ferment. Um, so you can see if you have a look, um, my bowl was really full up to here and now that I've worked the salt through the vegetables it's reduced a lot. So uh, as the vegetables lose a little bit of their liquid uh, they shrink and they shrivel uh, and that's great, that's a good sign, that's what should be happening. <laughs> so keep going, this is a good um, arm exercise. <laughs> Um, so nice to be able to do this with so many people on Zoom and so many people that I 
maybe you wouldn't have had the chance to do this with. So this is amazing. Um, there we go. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Mine is almost there. Um, and mine actually isn't producing a whole lot of liquid. Um, that's because uh, savoy cabbage tends to not have a lot of a big, a big, big water content. So um, I'll tell you what to do with that. We really want our veggies to be submerged once they're in the jar. Um, the bacteria were the main bacteria we are working with are lactic um, lactic acid bacteria and. Uh, Lactic acid bacteria are, is just a type of bacteria that breaks down uh, lactose, which um, kind of the word sounds like it's associated with milk. It certainly exists in milk, but it's just a sugar that is present across many foods. Um, so what the bacteria does is they, they break down this sugar into something called lactic acid. And that's what gives the traditional sour tang that we are used to with ferments if, if you eat them. Can we use some fruits as well, like apple? Yes, you definitely can. Apple is great in sauerkraut. In fact, it's very traditional to put apple in sauerkraut. So um, again, any hard fruits like apple or pear um, work really well. So if you have one and you don't know what to do with it, throw it in. <laughs> um, again, kind of chopping it finely or grating it um, will, will really um, kind of give you a little bit of a sweet edge to your ferment, which um, can be really nice. Okay, I'm going to show you what mine is looking like. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's really much softer and it's reduced um, probably about half to what it was. So that's really what you're aiming for. And it takes a little bit of scrunching, but uh, we'll get there. <laughs> so I'm going to now stop my scrunching because I'm pretty happy with that. And uh, mine hasn't produced so much liquid, but that's okay. I'm gonna throw away the hot water in my jar. Um, I'm just gonna swish some cold water inside just to cool it down a little bit. Um, there we go, so empty now. And um, I'm going to uh, fill up my jar with my cabbage. <laughs> so if you're ready to do that, um, follow along. Don't worry if, if you're not. Um, I'm just going to walk you through it. So basically, we're just going to throw in our scrunched up vegetables um, inside the jar. And you want to really pack them in. Um, and you can keep scrunching as you go, but we're trying to avoid um, Kind of any air pockets inside the jar and uh, we really want everything really nicely packed in into one jar or several jars depending on what you've got um, so I am sorry you can't see I'm gonna move over I'm really sort of packing everything in with my fist and making sure everything is nicely my jar is slightly bigger than a liter, so I might have some room at the top. Um, don't worry if you don't, uh, as long as everything fits, um, that should be totally fine. So keep going, keep pressing them down. I've got some bigger bits here, which I'm just gonna leave in, that's fine. Pressing it in. And if you can see at the at the bottom of my bowl, there's a little bit of whoop, <laughs> of juice uh, that I've just poured out of my bowl. So don't do that. Um, and that is really valuable juice, and you want to throw that in with with your veggies. So depending on what you've got, as I was saying before, um, when you push your vegetables down in your jar, the liquid. If you've got a lot of liquid, it will rise to the surface, and that's really great. Uh, because the lactic acid bacteria um, actually live well and, and reproduce well um, in an environment without oxygen, and that means under liquid. So um, if your vegetables haven't produced uh, any liquid or not enough to cover themselves, 
um, what I would suggest you do and what I'm going to do now is getting a, a bit of cold water, um, just tap water is fine. Um, I'm just going to put it in my bowl so I can rinse off the rest of the vegetables. So I've got some water in here and I'm going to sprinkle a bit of salt. Um, now I was really precise with the salt and the vegetables. Uh, with this we can be a little bit less precise. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a sprinkle just to create a brine to submerge my vegetables. So I've dropped in about a teaspoon of salt into um, maybe half a liter or maybe even less than that too, like a cup of water. So I've got my brine and I'm going to pour that into my jar. So I make sure my veggies are submerged. Can I use whey instead of water? Um, yes, you can. Um, I don't tend to do that just because I don't tend to have whey or I use it for other things. Um, but you can, whey um, is, full of, is, is full of good bacteria um, from milk or from yogurt um, if, if it's been um, fermented. So you can add that in, that will kickstart the process. Uh, it might give you a slightly different flavor than if you're just using water, but that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, throw that in. I would maybe dilute it with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, water um, and still add a little bit of extra salt uh, to compensate for, for the extra volume that you're putting in your jar. But yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, so really pressing my veggies in. And you can see that now they're submerged or relatively submerged. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they're all underwater. I need to press them down a little bit more. And there's no air pockets. There's no little air bubbles or, or big, big air pockets, which is a great sign because I want to keep them submerged. Um, I don't know if you can see it well, but this is my lovely sauerkraut. It's green and orange, looking great already. And uh, the liquid on top. All right, so. Um, now we are ready to put our beautiful time travel portals in a quiet corner of our kitchen. <laughs> so I've, I've got a clip top jar, I've just closed it um, tightly and I'm going to put it in a little kind of quiet corner. I've got my fermentation station at the end of the kitchen there where all my weird ferments live. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to do, I, I advise you to put a little plate under your jar. So what will happen is if your jar is full, particularly if your jar is full, um, as the fermentation starts to happen, you see lots of bubbles um, and lots of activity happening in your veggies. And what, what that will do is it will encourage the liquid to come out of the jar and to avoid making a mess. Basically, you just put a bowl or a little plate underneath, um, underneath your jar. And every day or every other day, just check on it and um, open up the lid. Um, you've essentially gained a little baby that you need to look after and you need to burp it every day. <laughs> so you open the lids and you let it breathe. Uh, it might, um, a, bit, a little bit of liquid might spill out, but that's fine, that's normal. That just means that fermentation is, is happening. Someone told me about using freezer bag with water as a lid. Can you use metal cover lids? Um, this is this is a really good question actually. Um, can you use metal cover lids? Um, you can use metal cover lids. Fermentation doesn't do so well with metal. Um, sometimes it's re it reacts badly with metal. Uh, hence us using um, glass jars or um, you can even use Tupperwares if, if, if that's all you've got. Uh, but if you do have a jar with a metal lid, what I encourage you to do is get a little bit of um, parchment paper and just, for example, I've got this lid here. Just put it um, on the underside of the lid and screw that on so the metal doesn't touch the fermented veggies, just to be safe. Um, and uh, let's say someone told me about using a freezer bag with water as a lid. Um, as long as that covers the full surface of your fermented veggies, that could be used as a lid. Normally that's used, um, I've seen it being used as a weight to keep your vegetables submerged. 
Um, so if you see them coming out of the liquid a lot, or the liquid, um, um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you see them coming out of the liquid, then you can certainly use a freezer bag filled with water inside your jar, just as a weight to keep everything submerged. Um, as your fermentation happens and the liquid is drawn out, you'll notice perhaps that the surface gets drier and uh, that's a really great way for mold to grow. So I uh, would um, advise making another little brine like I did before and just topping it up so you make sure everything's nicely submerged. Um, more questions. I still have bubbles in the jar. What can I do to make it disappear? If they're tiny, tiny bubbles, don't worry about them. Um, I think that's fine as long as they're not sort of big air pocket pockets. Um, those are those are more difficult. So tiny bubbles is okay. Uh, don't worry too much about them. And for how long do you leave the lid open every day? Uh, it's really just a matter of opening and closing. <laughs> and you'll notice how how long it needs to be open for. Again, trust trust yourself, and you'll see that um, it just needs the bubbles just need to rise to the surface, and the air just needs to escape a little bit, and then you can close it back up. It's not very long. Uh, so right, I'm gonna close my jar. There we go. You can name it if you want. <laughs> and I'm gonna put it back there. I'll, I'll put a plate under it in a bit. Um, and I'll show you just an example of a sauerkraut that I made um, a few weeks ago. So your, um, your fermented vegetables are now uh, going to sit in your jar and it'll take them anywhere between two to three weeks to be ready. Um, again, this depends on your personal taste. I recommend that you start tasting them after around five days. It's also a really nice way to notice um, how the flavor changes and what fermentation actually does to texture and, and flavor of vegetables. Um, so, um, so yeah, start tasting and keep tasting every other day until you're, you're happy with it. Oh, look. <laughs> There's a little jar of lovely babies. <laughs> Amazing, they're great. <laughs> um, so yeah, just keep tasting and, um, and see, see how you feel. I'm ha I was happy with this one um, after around two, two and a half weeks. So what I did was I moved it to the fridge and moving it to the fridge basically um, kind of slows down the fermentation process. So if you're happy with the flavor, that means that you sort of put a stop to, um, to the flavor changing or the texture changing so much and you pop it in the fridge. And this honestly will, if you don't finish it before that, it will kind of last forever. I've got fermented things that I did a year ago and they're super. <laughs> so um, that it's gonna last a really, really long time. Um, someone asked the question, can I taste with a metal fork or is that going to mess it up? Yeah, tasting with a metal fork is fine. You just don't want it in contact with metal for long periods of time. So you can grab a fork and, um, and, and use that to taste. That's totally fine. Um, the sauerkraut I made a couple of weeks ago is very squeaky. Is that okay? Uh, I think so. Squeaky as in it makes a squeaky sound when you, when you bite it. <laughs> Um, that sounds nice, I think. Um, I think squeaky is good. Yes. <laughs> um, the liquid that appears in the end of the bowl when we are involving the vegetables is to put in the jars, right? Yes, it is. So throw that in the jar. That's all great liquid. It contains a little bit of the salt that you added in and all the good stuff from the veggies. So yeah, absolutely put that in. Um, wonderful. So now, uh, that I've guided you through this, um, I, as in, and in the spirit of a collaborative practice with all the species that we see and we don't see around us, um, I wanted to invite you to a little group drawing writing session. Um, I've just shared a whiteboard and I'm going to try and just make it bigger so everyone can see it. Um, and there we go. I think you can all see it, I hope. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> and um, you can, this is a, a kind of communal collective drawing tool. So if you go um, up in your screen and use your um, mouse to go up and scroll um, and um, hover the mouse um, kind of above your window, there'll be this menu that comes up where you can, um, you can click uh, to, to choose your tools to work. On, on this whiteboard. Um, there are some questions. 
the jar should be put in a dark place. There are some hearts appearing. There we go. So um, I'll just continue answering questions. But yeah, if you want to drop in any impressions of of uh, this fermentation process, if how you know how you found it, or how if anything has popped up in your mind about this idea of of collaborative of interspecies collaboration, or um, this idea of being closer to our environment by by using fermentation as a tool to eat it, essentially. Um, or anything that's popped up in your head, please do drop a little drawing in or a word, um, anything you like. The, the little bar at the top, uh, just be mindful that it might be, if you have, if you're viewing it with all the speakers uh, in, in a row above, it might be behind that. So just move your speakers um, column down and you'll see it. Um, but these are great. Look, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll, I'll carry on answering some questions. You can also ask me questions by raising your hand and then muting your microphone. Um, or I can, I can unmute it for you so I can hear you instead of just hearing me. <laughs> um, the jar should be put in a dark place. Uh, yes. As long as there's no direct sunlight shining on it, then you're good to go. Mine kind of live in that little corner behind me and uh, there's no sun kind of shining on them. It's not absolutely dark, it's not inside a cupboard. Um, so that's fine, as long as they're not kind of in the sun directly, because that would just overheat them, um, and that's not, not good. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Wow, look at this, this is great. <laughs> I am loving it. I'm gonna do some drawings too. And you can change colors, you can do stickers, but I see that you're all well, very well versed in this, much better than I am. I'm going to draw a little bacteria. <laughs> there we go. Um, so if you want to do this recipe again, uh, we're going to send the re recipe to you so you can apply it to any vegetables you like. Um, we're going to hang here for a little bit and keep drawing. Uh, and I'll be here for more questions if you have them uh, about fermentation, about a practice, about anything. <laughs> uh, what meals do you recommend having fermented veg with? This is a great question. Um, I mean, I have it with anything, but <laughs> um, having it uh, in a sandwich is beautiful with cheese if you eat dairy. Um, alongside um, fish, I think is really lovely if you, if you eat fish. Um, also just on its own as a starter uh, with a little glass of wine and a selection of different fermented veggies or pickles that you might have lying around is a really beautiful way to start a meal or to, um, you know, sit outside for a bit after a long day of work. <laughs> um, there's someone having a drink that would go great with your fermented veggies. <laughs> and um, yeah, what else do I have it in? Uh, depends, depends where I'm fermenting. I've, I'll show you some experiments maybe. I've just made this, um, I don't know if you can see my camera still, but I think you can. Um, I've just made this um, fermented chili sauce, which is um, kind of following a little bit the same rules, but it's basically just chilies and peppers blitzed together with salt, and I added a little bit of honey. And that's going to ferment away for a few days, and this is super nice with scrambled eggs for breakfast. <laughs> Uh, or just something to dip bread into to have um, on the side of any dish really, any meal. Um, like a veggie stew or a veggie curry maybe. Um, and yeah, this is one of my recent favorites. Um, other things I love to ferment, um, a new favorite has been green beans, uh, which is amazing when you just put them uh, you don't even need to scrunch them up. You can just do a uh, 2% brine. So one liter of water, 20 grams of salt. Submerge your green beans whole in that, um, in that brine and you're good to go. After a few weeks, they're beautiful. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going crazy with, with the drawings and I love it. <laughs> a little hard for you. <laughs> This is so nice. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, but yeah, hang around if you want to ask me anything. Um, but um, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's it really. Um, I'm. I hope that you've 
enjoyed it. And um, if you remember anything that you want to ask, uh, you can ask me later by uh, um, emailing me or, or call, you know, messaging me on, on social media. Um, thank you for the messages. <laughs> Um, and it's been really lovely to do this. Thank you to Block Universe for having me. Uh, so nice to be able to access an audience that I wouldn't have accessed otherwise. Um, and to be able to see all of you and ferment with all of you. Um, you're lovely. <laughs> and I hope we, we get to see each other again. So yeah, feel free to hang out and do more drawings um, and, and go as you feel. Um, but I'm sure we'll find each other again. Um, <laughs> thank you those very sweet messages um and yeah again feel free to ask you know and mute and ask a question if you'd like to speak to me directly because it's kind of weird to be speaking and only hearing my voice Thanks everyone. Yeah, keep an eye out um, for future workshops. Uh, tomorrow actually I should tell you, I'm uh, joining uh, Berlin Collective. Um, oh yeah, someone just asked, I wanted to take a picture with everyone with their jars. So that's a great idea. Um, why don't we uh, show our jars and our cameras and we can take a little screenshot. Um, I'm gonna save the, I think I need to, do I need to leave to leave the drawing? Yes, I do. So I'm going to save this drawing, and we can um, we can send that to you. Uh, there we go. It's saved, and we can all go back to a gallery view, and let us see your jars, <laughs> so we can have a collective group picture with our new babies. Ah, <laughs> oh, they're so nice. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> There we are. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, someone just asked a question. Uh, will you talk a little bit more about time travel portal, aka fermentation? Um, yes. So I, I, I tend to use that, <laughs> that metaphor of, of the time travel portal um, as a way to say that fermentation is this kind of tool for um, preserving food and for stretching the life of food. And you're stretching it's life, um, so I'm making these cabbages last much longer than they would uh, if they were just fresh sitting on my counter. Um, but I'm also stretching the yield in, in the sense that you can eat much more, you know, boiled cabbage simply with, you know, a little bit of salt than you can fermented cabbage. So perhaps I could eat one of the whole cabbages that, um, that I had, that I put into this jar, just if I, you know, boiled it, chopped it up and ate it as my dinner. Um, but I probably wouldn't be able to eat a full jar of sauerkraut. Uh, it's too acidic for the stomach and maybe a little bit too overpowering. So, in, in th and that's what we're doing through fermentation. We're not only stretching uh, the life of, of food, but we're stretching the yield. So we're playing, we're playing with these two dimensions of time and space or, or time and, and, and physicality, I suppose. Um, and that's why I see it as this portal to travel through space and time. And also in the way that um, when you're fermenting food, you are collecting this information from the environment, uh, from you know, microbes that live on, on particles in the air um, and in your hands that you're imparting into, into your um, ferments. So you're sort of capturing all of these things and uh, capturing them in different moments in time throughout the fermentation process um, and, and, and having them in this, in this jar, which becomes your archive in a way or another. Um, so that, that's also why I see it as a portal to travel through all these dimensions. Another question. Do the jar lids need to be really tight? Um, they don't need to be super tight. Um, I have a clip top jar, so I just like to secure it. Um, I, I secure it because I don't want any flies getting in and now it's really hot. So flies are around <laughs> and, um, I just want to keep them out. So that's why I close, close it tightly, but I just make sure I open it every day. If you had just have a lid, uh, a metal lid resting on top, that's also fine. Uh, it means that you don't have to burp your jar every day. Um, just keep an eye out for any liquid that might be spilling out. And another question. 
do fresh herbs work? Um, fermenting soft things like herbs and spinach and kind of soft greens um, doesn't yield very good results. They're just a little bit too soft to work and you end up with this kind of strange mushy paste. They ferment really quickly. Um, I, you know, you can try it <laughs> and see how it goes, but um, it doesn't tend to give very good results. Um, and they just sort of spoil very quickly. You just need to keep a close eye on them. Um, and another question, did you say they need to be in a darkish space? Um, yeah, just as long as they don't have any direct sunlight shining on them, they'll be absolutely fine. So they don't need to be inside a cupboard or hidden away in a cave. They can just be in a corner of your kitchen where no direct sun rays will get to it. Um, so yeah, if you, um, what about the fridge? So uh, putting your um, fermented vegetables into the fridge basically stops or, or slows down the fermentation to a rate that is so slow that it's almost like it's, it's not really happening. So you really want to leave it out at room temperature for at least a week or two um, and, and keep tasting it, see how it changes and evolves. And once you're happy with the flavor, move it to the fridge. So then you know that that crunch and that flavor stays kind of in that state and you sort of freeze it in time. Um, again, playing with time and physical dimensions. Um, so I wouldn't put it in the fridge right now because that just um, will stop the, for any fermentation from starting, uh, from, yeah, from even starting. So keep it outside for a bit, um, no sunlight, couple of weeks, taste it in a few days, um, see how you like it, and then move it to the fridge once you're happy with it. If you want to keep me updated or keep us updated with your fermentation adventures, uh, just tag Block Universe or tag me um, on social media. I think my Instagram has been posted on the chat. Um, I'm sure it's been, it's been shared with you in the email. Um, so just let us know. I'd love to see how your ferments go. And uh, if you have any questions, please um, yeah, ask away another time. What's the longest amount of time you can ferment it um, outside the fridge? So that really depends, as I said at the beginning, um, temperature, humidity, um, you know, everything that you've got in your kitchen will influence your fermented veggies or fruits. Um, and they might ferment quicker if it's really warm and they're chopped up really finely or slower if it's cold. So it's really a matter of, um, you know, keeping an eye on it. I would say that for something like cabbage or carrots or the things that we've done today, um, you'll probably need a minimum of a week I'd say a maximum of four weeks, uh, considering the current weather, um, depending on where you are in the world, because you might not be in, in a warm weather like, like me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that would, would be my advice. But really trust, trust your sense of smell, sense of taste, um, and, uh, and see how you go. And you, if you're not um, used to eating fermented foods, if, if you start working with them and making them, you'll soon find out what you like and what you don't like. Um, and yeah, I think that's it, everyone. Um, thank you so, so much for joining us and for joining me. It's been really, really nice to see you all. And I hope to catch you soon another time. And yeah, feel free to reach out. We're going to send everyone an email with recipes and notes. Um, but yeah, I'll, I really, really appreciate you all being here. And uh, thank you so much. And I'll see you very soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.